Um, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we are ready to, to start. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for today's webinar. My name is Carolina Caeiro. I am coordinator of development projects at LACNIC. And today I will be moderating this webinar on the final project results of the initiative IT Goes Global, uh, which we have been uh, running in Haiti for the last uh, three years. Um, I would like to start off with a few quick announcements about the dynamics and logistics for uh, today's webinar. Um, the first thing I would like to mention uh, for everyone's information is that the webinar will be recorded. Uh, so please keep that in mind. We hope that's uh, not an issue for any of the participants today. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that we will have uh, four presentations today and two rounds of uh, Q&A, questions and answers. Um, there are two ways of asking questions. Uh, you may type, type um, at any time your question in the chat, uh, and we will read uh, the questions uh, for you once we open up for Q&A. Or uh, you may also raise your hand uh, by clicking on the hand icon, um, and we will open your mic uh, so that you can ask your question uh, live to, to the speakers also during the Q&A segment. Um, lastly, I wanted to um, let you know that all presentations today will be in English. Um, we know that there may be uh, French speakers in the audience, uh, so feel free to ask questions in French if you feel more co comfortable in that language. Um, and also, if um, there is anything, um, again, this is for the French speakers, uh, if there is anything that isn't clear about the presentations, uh, we are happy to do a one-on-one -on -one follow up after the webinar to, to discuss the project results. Um, well, jumping in straight into the webinar then, um, and for those of you who are less familiar with the project, um, IT Goes Global was a, a joint initiative by LACNIC and IDRC that sought to uh, connect women, Haitian women, with online work opportunities. Um, and as such, we would like to start the webinar with some opening remarks by LACNIC, which is the entity that has coordinated the overall project uh, with the various program partners, um, and IDRC, which has been both um, a partner to the project and funder uh, for the initiative. Um, we have Ben Petrosini, Lead Program Specialist for IDRC, present with us today. Uh, ben, would you mind taking the floor um, and sharing with us your, your opening remarks? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ben. Please go ahead. Good. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, this is a, a real pleasure to be uh, here participating of this um, event. Uh, we we started this project uh, more than three years ago with the, the tinkling around of ideas in seeking a solution for uh, people, young people in low income and low resourced environment that would, were constrained by geography uh, and the fact that local markets were rather small and so on. So job opportunities were very limited. And this was an exploration on the possibilities, uh, but at the same time, the challenges that online uh, work and opportunities would provide uh, those kind of populations. So uh, Haiti in some ways was um, a case study uh, of what it implies or what it requires and what are the um, possibilities of um, building these uh, opportunities, employment opportunities for young people in low uh, resourced environment. Um, this in some ways applies very much to situations of um, uh, fragile uh, societies, uh, which is an area in which IDRC will be working quite a bit for the next uh, 10 years. So this project uh, provides a lot of input and lessons and learnings and knowledge on what to do and what not to do and how to do it um, when you are trying to uh, support employment opportunities in the digital world for young 
people that have had not the opportunities of um, a lot of uh, middle and, and higher income countries would have. <clears throat> so ben, uh, ben, people are asking for you to speak a bit closer to the microphone as they're having trouble to hear you. Can, can they hear me there? Um, we hear you better now, yes. Please go oh. ahead. Okay, so uh, this project, um, I was saying that, that it's not only a project in Haiti, but it provides a uh, basis and learnings and knowledge for a large number of other interventions around the world that RDRC is planning for the next 10 years in um, fragile states and fragile societies. So the project, I think it was um, uh, a very valuable experience for all of those involved, uh, going from people in, uh, in Lagnik, which was an outstanding partner, partners in the field uh, in Haiti and uh, partners in the Caribbean and uh, other places, New York, that participated in the project. Uh, also for, for beneficiaries of the project, it was uh, a valuable, but at the same time challenging endeavor. So I think today we will hear a number of uh, very useful presentations of a real world experience. Um, I think a number of the claims, hypotheses and uh, theories that are around the world uh, in terms of uh, opportunities in the digital world, um, online employment, are uh, many of them are not based on the kind of uh, real world experience that this project was able to, to uh, produce. Um, in some ways, the project is, is at this stage also in dialogue with another large global, global project that IDRC is supporting. It's called FOWIX, uh, Future of Work in the Global South, in which a number of academics around the world will learn from the experience uh, how, what, what are the implications of an attempt to train and, and provide employment to young uh, people in uh, low resourced uh, contexts. So in many ways, this is a very, very valuable project, a very challenging one, but one that will not end now. As I was saying, it's just the basis for a number of activities that IDRC is planning for the next 10 years including uh, this project on the future of work in the Global South, in which we are assessing and, and studying the impact of uh, digital innovations on the job market. Uh, with those uh, few words, let me close Carolina here. And thank you very much to Lagnik and other partners for this excellent uh, job that you did during these past three years. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Ben, for, for those remarks. Um, we uh, um, also have Laura Kaplan, Development and Cooperation Manager at LACNIC with us. Uh, Laura, please go ahead with your remarks as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. Um, well, for us, it's also um, a pleasure to, to have been involved in this, in this project. We start um, well, three years ago with IT Goes Global, but uh, like Nick also had been working uh, in, in this field for more years. We started in 2013. Uh, so IT Goes Global was, um, was an opportunity for us. It was an opportunity because we, 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 we had a, a program in, in developing um, technical capacities um, but this project gives us the opportunity to, to expand our work and also get involved in, uh, in the capacity building for young women. That is uh, something very, very important for us. So, as you know, well, LACNIC is the Internet Registry, but we also are very 
involved and very um, very concerned about uh, giving the opportunity for local communities to use internet as an instrument for social inclusion. Uh, so we are. This project is not only about um, expanding uh, capacities, but also to um, be sure that we we keep doing that mission and we keep um, building an internet that can be used for for that purpose. Um, also, I, I want to thank uh, every organization, every partner we we had because for LACNIC, it, it was not only a, a project that allowed us to keep building uh, this uh, and continue uh, working in, 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 this, in this field, but also the opportunity to open up and leave this foundation, this, um, this, this other uh, people that get involved in this mission that is so important. So for us, it's, uh, it's, it's really successful to to know that the, for example, the, the ICT cluster uh, is working. Uh, there are a lot of, of people and young women that uh, go through the, this process and um, that getting uh, got engaged in in, in using uh, the internet, and and also to know that uh, that you, the, our partners. Um, are involved with this, and and we expand uh, our um, yes our, our work, and we we were we were not so alone as we began like uh, six six years ago. So we, I'm really excited to hear um, these presentations. Uh, I'll be here all the the webinar if you have questions, and so glad to. To be finished this with uh, uh, what I think it was a, a very good job, and I think that we are going to learn a lot uh, about this experience. Thank you so much, and thank you, Carolina. All right, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for those remarks. Um, all right, so um, before um, jumping into the presentations of today, and particularly for those of you who are uh, less familiar with the project. We'd like to start off with a brief introduction about the IT Goes Global um, initiative. Um, as I mentioned earlier, IT Goes Global as a project had a very uh, simple or straightforward goal. We essentially sought to increase women's access to employment in Haiti by working with local women in helping them strengthen and, and develop skills or, or, or digital capacities. Um, as uh, Laura and Ben mentioned, ITIG was a joint effort by LACNIC and IDRC, um, but the project was implemented with um, the crucial support of multiple uh, local partners, uh, primarily ESSI, the Higher School of Infotronics of Haiti, um, and Transversal. Um, we also worked with a range of international partners, uh, namely the Caribbean Open Institute, 3x3 Design, and Slash Roots all of which will be presented in today's webinar, so you'll be hearing uh, uh, directly uh, from them um, in a little while. Um, another thing that is important to highlight, uh, and I think um, you know, Ben uh, got a bit to the heart of this, is that IT Goes Global was a pilot initiative. Um, as I will mention in a second, we worked uh, with a very sort of limited groups of people, uh, and essentially, uh, there were a, a range of challenges or questions that we wanted to find answers to as a result of this pilot. Um, first, we wanted to explore how to develop scalable uh, digital skills trainings that were apt for resource-constrained environments such as Haiti, meaning environments uh, that uh, face challenges around connectivity, access to uh, digital equipment, and so forth. Um, second of all, and after uh, working on building those digital skills uh, with our program beneficiaries, we also wanted to explore um, how to address entry barriers uh, to the digital economy. That is to say how the women we train could access uh, new work opportunities primarily online. Um, and third, and this was uh, very important uh, for LACNIC being one of the five uh, internet registries, the project also sought um, to explore strategies to mitigate technical factors uh, that limit internet uh, growth in Haiti. 
So these are the three sort of large challenges or questions that we have set out, set out to answer uh, with the project. Um, this takes me um, to how the project was uh, structured and how today's presentation is also structured. Um, essentially, we, we worked on three fronts. Um, first, training women. Um, our colleagues from the Caribbean Open Institute developed online courses aimed at building digital skills based on, on potential jobs that our, our um, beneficiaries uh, could do online. Um, second, we had a um, project component around employability. Uh, once uh, program beneficiaries graduated from the trainings, we worked with them in linking them um, to work opportunities. Uh, again, primarily on online platforms, but also in the domestic market. And we also supported them more broadly with other aspects that had to do with their transition to, to professional life. Um, and lastly, we had a third component that focused on internet development, uh, which ties uh, very closely to the mission of Lagning and its uh, prior work uh, with the local technical community um, before the launch of IT Goes Global. Um, Haiti is uh, estimated to have an internet penetration of 15%. Um, and with this component, the rationale was that if we were to design a project that relied on online trainings and that sought to bring more Haitian women into the digital economy, it was also important to work on laying the foundations or strengthening the basis for internet growth. Um, and here, um, what we focused on was uh, on training IT professionals and encouraging articulations among the local technical community, uh, which you will hear uh, more about um, uh, later in the webinar. Um, we have um, spoken so far quite a bit about Haitian women as uh, the project beneficiaries. So I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper into the profile of our uh, target population. Um, through the project, we target uh, targeted primarily young women who were approximately 20 to 30 years old of age, though the majority were uh, in their early to mid 20s. Um, and we worked with a total of uh, 300 beneficiaries. Um, and within this group, we had also different profiles, um, which we have grouped into sort of three segments, which you can see here in the screen. Um, first, we had university students who represented around 50% of our beneficiaries. Um, these were essentially students pursuing a higher education degree, um, and this group had higher digital skills and, and greater access to connectivity and digital, digital equipment. Um, we also had some 15% uh, uh, of participants who were employed or actively seeking for employment, uh, usually in uh, non-digital fields. Um, and this group uh, essentially had less internet access or access to digital equipment. They had some level of digital skills and they had rated themselves as having strong uh, soft skills as they, they had um, prior exposure to, to work environments. Um, and lastly, we had some 35% of students who were um, unemployed or home-based. And this group was the least likely to have internet access or access to digital equipment and generally um, it was a group that had also lower digital uh, skills entering the program. Um, we also did see some commonalities across these three profiles. I'd like to point out two. Um, first, in connection to time use, um, they all had other activities or responsibilities before, uh, beyond participating in the program, uh, whether it was university, work, or domestic responsibilities. Um, and we will see that this played a role in how the participants uh, engaged uh, with, with program activities. Um, and they also share uh, an interest uh, in finding work. Uh, the great majority of beneficiaries reported that they wanted to seek uh, a job or work post uh, completion of the training, uh, and also reported a preference for part, uh, for part-time or independent uh, work uh, that would allow them to continue with other activities such as uh, studying. So we could say that they saw the program in a way um, as some sort of stepping stone to, to achieve this goal of uh, eventually securing uh, employment. So uh, having given you that overview, we're ready to jump into the presentations. Um, here on the screen, you can see the structure uh, for today's webinar. Um, we will start off with Maurice McNaughton from the Caribbean Open Institute, who will present what we have identified as drivers for success with our online trainings. Um, Max Larson Henry from Transversal uh, and also ITIC's uh, local project coordinator will pre uh, present our work to strengthen the internet development in Haiti. 
Um, and uh, we will stop there for a first round of Q&A. And then we will have Marlene Sam, who is academic director at ESSI and also the program's uh, employment coordinator. She will present the project's uh, experience connecting women uh, with work opportunities. And lastly, we will have uh, Priyanka Jain representing 3 by 3 Design and the research team that conducted uh, the m and &E of the project. Uh, Priyanka will present the key lessons uh, from the initiative around online employment and gender transformation. And after this, uh, we will open up again for Q&A. So uh, having said that, uh, let's jump into the first presentation. Uh, Marie, Maurice, uh, would you mind uh, taking the floor, please? Uh, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So it's a pleasure to, uh, to connect again with this group that we've worked with so closely for the last uh, year and a half and, and to share perspectives from, from this uh, really important project that's been as Ben said, I mean, there's a clear developmental component which uh, Carolina spoke to, but there's also a strong research element to this uh, in terms of what can we learn um, uh, that would allow us to not only replicate but scale uh, what we've done in Haiti into similar contexts. Um, so really the research question could be framed around how do we address, it, address the challenge of the scaling digital skills training in environments that have uh, constrained resources. And that, that's, that's not only a Caribbean issue, but it's more common than we like to think in the developing world. Um, next uh, slide, Caroline. Uh, so I think, and you, you'll hear more about the, the, the factors uh, arising from the m and presentation, but, but, but clearly for us, um, you, you could group those into two broad categories. Um, so there are clear infrastructural factors around internet connectivity, the availability of power, um, just being able to afford transportation to get to uh, the location for meeting once a week. Um, again, we tend to uh, underestimate the impact of that kind of constraint and, and having access to a device. And, and then you combine with those the social cultural factors around um, having the time to spend on this program when people are concerned with their basic livelihoods, uh, especially in the context of women, um, perhaps uh, more domestic responsibilities, the constraints of financial resources. And then as we discovered, um, you know, baseline capabilities, as Carolina indicated, the range of persona that participated in this program from people who are actually in university to people who have uh, just finished high school. So the range of starting capabilities and uh, language, of course, is, is also a constraint, especially when one starts to look to the online job opportunities. Next slide. So the way we designed the curriculum and the courses was, was very deliberate and, and informed by not only these considerations, but um, the findings that came out of research conducted by 3x3 uh, design and, and also slash rules. Um, so for instance, uh, Designing this course to be online combined with in-person facilitation was really important to address the constraints on internet, that time availability and transportation costs. Um, but again, recognizing the uh, resource constraints in Haiti, we wanted to use a blended approach. So not just completely online, but combining that with face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, providing the students with tablets uh, was a really important decision that we took. Uh, early in the program um, that again addressed a lot of the constraints that we mentioned earlier but it also allowed us to fully pursue this idea of the flipped classroom model so that um, they can take the courses home with them and they have the flexibility to interact and consume course content whether it's at night or you know offline um, so it provides the kind of flexibility that, that became very important for many of the students um, and as you'll see, the design of the curriculum and the content was very much um, anchored around research that informed a set of job opportunities that are available online. So uh, very much a competency, what we call a competency-based design of the program. So when people complete this program, we want them to be enabled um, to pursue a set of real and, and practical job opportunities. 
Peer-to-peer -peer learning is important. Uh, the facilitated sessions, the use of facilitators, um, learning from each other, um, supporting the students through practice sessions. These are all aspects of the design, both in terms of the curriculum and the delivery model, as well as the blended learning environment that we thought was quite important to um, improving the, increasing the chances of uh, success. Uh, next slide, Carolina. Uh, so this uh, is kind of a graphical representation of what that uh, curriculum design uh, looked like. Um, so I'll, I'll say three things about this uh, graphic. Uh, first, um, again, it, it highlights the competency-based um, design so that for the most part, we're starting with a set of identified job opportunities and you'll see four of them that were found to be quite prevalent um, in the online digital work. So uh, SEO clerk, uh, mobile web app tester, data processor, market researcher. And those really inform the competencies that we did design for and the course content. Um, so that ultimately the students who came out of this would be in a reasonable position to bid for those kinds of jobs. Uh, the second thing about this is the modularity of the curriculum and course design so that we didn't want to stream people into a single competence. So as you see, it's a very much a layered approach where they learn a threshold set of competencies that we refer to as digital learner. And then we segmented that into two streams of competencies for internet practitioners and data practitioners. As it turned out, um, over the course of the 12-week program, all students did both streams um, so that at the end of the day, we're able to equip them with a set of skills that would, again, put them in a reasonable position to bid for these kinds of jobs. Uh, the only third observation on this is that uh, we started with baselining uh, the students' um, starting competencies. So as was mentioned earlier, the range of people participating in this program with different skill sets and so we thought it was important to baseline that using a digital profile diagnostic which was applied at the beginning of each cohort and that was not so much to create a barrier to entry as it was to understand each person's starting position so that uh, both facilitators could uh, work with those who might need more help in getting into the whole digital uh, learning uh, so that is essentially the design, and that manifested itself in a set of model courses. Um, so there were four courses um, that made up the program. Uh, so beginning with foundations of being digital, um, and you can see there the modules. So this was very modular. Um, so each of these modules the students could complete um, in a week or so, so that each of these courses took anywhere from two to three weeks, uh, which ultimately became a 12-week program. And, and very importantly, we, we thought the, the, the course should end with a kind of capstone that really allowed the students to apply what they've learned and to uh, apply those in real-world context so that we created a set of scenarios that uh, really challenge them in terms of critical thinking and problem solving. So it's not just learning the materials, but now how do you apply that in the real world? And that's really trying to prepare them for the follow-on activities in terms of uh, uh, applying for online jobs. Uh, so just very quickly on the, uh, the results as we saw them. Caroline, if you move on to the next slide. Yeah, so just by way of summarizing the results, I mean, one of the things that was, uh, I think, very notable was that we had very high throughput rate. So the attrition was very low, and the graduation rate was very high. And by graduation here, we mean students that were actually successful in exceeding the, the, the threshold score across all courses. Now, I don't want to trivialize this because if, one, if you think about the typical retention rates for online learning uh, and the MOOCs, I mean, these, these are well documented. This is in the order of 10%. Uh, we, we think that this high throughput rate can be accredited to not only the blended approach, 
uh, but the role of facilitators. And I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. But that, I think, was one of the uh, really impressive outcomes in terms of the high uh, throughput. Um, and while things like power, uh, internet connectivity, access to transportation, and financial resources were severe barriers, it did not correlate with people's performance. So even with constraints, people made the effort. And again, that's, a, that's an interesting outcome. The other thing we found in looking at, uh, and again, Brian can say more about the, the m and &E, but uh, certainly aside from what they learned, uh, students found um, very useful just getting oriented uh, with this online uh, digital environment. Um, so the basic digital literacy, uh, understanding the norms and the rules of being a good digital citizen. I think people found those, uh, those outcomes very important to them personally. And in fact, they reflected on this as something that other persons, both in their families and their peers, um, noted. So while the skills in terms of productivity tools, data management skills, um, understanding the online world, those important skills, but there's a lot of personal development as well. I think that that's really, that's a really important outcome. Um, one interesting observations here, and it um, actually speaks to uh, the follow on projects that we're looking at in terms of scalability. Um, when we got to the final cohort of 150 students, we wanted to um, group them into fully online facilitated and those that would participate in the blended face-to-face -face learning. And initially, as, as Marlene will tell you, we were a little concerned about students feeling marginalized because we're putting them into a completely online group. As it turned out, the stronger interest and preference as expressed by the students was in fact for the fully online learning. And I suppose, uh, you know, in, in thinking about it, uh, the flexibility that it gives them um, and the ability to address the constraints of transportation and security and so forth, it's, it's perhaps easy to understand why uh, students express that preference. So again, that was a really interesting and important finding. And at the end of the day, it didn't impact severely on performance. So that was, that was a good, good learning as well. Uh, next slide, Carolina. So at the end of the day, um, the drivers for success, uh, for certainly for this program and factors that we look to uh, leverage going forward. Uh, student motivation, intrinsic student, student motivation is, is, is critical. And, and that speaks to how one recruits uh, the selection criteria that you use for getting students into the program. So at the end of the day, you know, with all the provisions that we're making in relation to pedagogy and devices and so forth, it, it has to start with wanting to do this. And we found that the general intrinsic motivation for the young women in Haiti was very high. And so I was quite impressed by that. Um, providing uh, digital equipment, in this case, tablets, um, to allow them to be able to consume materials and work from home and not have the constraints of uh, transportation and uh, the challenges of security and so forth was, was really important in this context, but I think really important generally. Uh, it is a significant enabler, and I think one of the things that it does, it equalizes persons that are, have different starting points. Uh, so persons will come to the program that have a computer at home and have internet access, and there are people that have never used the internet. And I think the tablet uh, device together with the orientation and the support of the facilitators was a really important uh, vehicle to normalize everyone to have the same opportunities for success. Uh, so the pedagogical design features of the course took into consideration a lot of what we've discussed, access to facilitation, uh, enabling peer-to-peer -peer support and learning. So when the, the kids meet on a weekly basis, they're not only engaging with their facilitators, but they're engaging with each other. And it's interesting to see in the online community, whether we're using Slack or Google Classroom, that when someone poses a question, very often a peer answers before the facilitator addresses it. So that providing an environment for that kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction is really important. Having course content that is not only relevant to job opportunities, but also adapted to local context is important. And at the end of the day, um, 
this kind of uh, uh, training is, is, is a really important that we allow for a certain degree of autonomy. So not only in Haiti, but I think in many other Caribbean contexts, the opportunity for people to go to a physical place called school for four days a week, five, six hours a day is, 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 is very limited. And so providing that autonomous learning opportunity is really important uh, driver for success. Can't say enough about the next item, the facilitators as tutors, as mentors, as uh, just persons that the students look up to. That was really critical. And one of the, uh, the factors for the programs like this going forward is training those facilitators to be able to discharge this role in the most effective manner. Um, well, the last item, you hear a little bit more about that from Marlene, but uh, Caroline, if you skip forward, um, we represent a lot of the learnings and these insights and these success factors in this, what we refer to as a blended learning model for scalable digital skills training. So it, it represents those three components, the, the idea of having the self-paced um, progressive uh, training content that's modular and deployed either as web application or as standalone applications that can be accessed and consumed on a mobile phone. Um, the idea of having this uh, blended component where we have these facilitator-led sessions on a regular basis, it could be weekly, it could be fortnightly, but extremely important. And the third element, which we haven't spoken much about, but uh, the, the idea of building the course content in such a way that we can capture uh, data that allows us to understand um, the learner's behavior, um, what course content works well, um, that, that's, that, that's a really important uh, component. So this is actually the blended learning delivery model that we're taking from this project and we're rolling into the Caribbean School of Data's ambitions for a larger rollout of this kind of training. Um, so very important um, insights and uh, yeah, look forward to your comments and questions and uh, any other opportunities to share what we've learned from this uh, really important project. So uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, would you mind saying a few words about the um, uh, Caribbean uh, Open School of Data? Um, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, so that uh, we're currently involved in the uh, scale of what we call the Caribbean School of Data, which is very much built around the model uh, and the insights derived from the Haiti project. It's a, it's, a, it's a project that's funded by Google. We were quite fortunate to, halfway through the, the Ag project, uh, get into a conversation. And they liked what they saw in, in, in the Ag project and said, well, can we do this across multiple countries. So right now that project is looking at uh, taking much of this learning and deploying that over six countries um, to impact a target of 1,500 uh, beneficiaries in the first instance. And those beneficiaries are largely drawn from what we loosely refer to as marginalized youth or unattached youth. But generally, the same demographic, youth that have limited opportunities that we think this kind of training and access to the online job world could address some of those uh, uh, challenges. So we've just launched that program. Uh, the Dominican Republic is uh, sort of our uh, flagship site. And, and I know Yassin is online. So um, we're, we're spinning up the first set of cohorts in the Dom Rep in uh, another couple of weeks. And over the course of the next 18 months, looking to, again, deploy this over six countries. Wonderful. Thank you, Maurice, for uh, sharing that information. We're very excited to um, see some of these le learnings, uh, you know, being taken up by, um, by the project uh, of the Caribbean School of Data. Um, I will um, now invite uh, Max Larson for the next presentation um, on Internet development in Haiti. Max, please go ahead. Thank you, Carolina. Good morning, everyone. Um, for this component, we look at the, first of all at the challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the challenge we have identified here is to develop interventions with local technical community to mitigate factors meeting internet growth. And to tackle this challenge, we use a two-punch approach. 
The first one is to strengthen the local human resources through online capacity building and on technical subjects. Those are um, subjects that we have identified as relevant for the domestic market through uh, discussing discussion with uh, um, stakeholders from the Haitian uh, internet community. And the second one is articulation among local technical community through the ICT cluster. So the ICT cluster was uh, created as a platform to bring together uh, IT professionals, IT stakeholders identified by the project and the local technical community to work on tangible improvements to uh, local internet infrastructure in Haiti. Next slide, please. So the, the first thing that we try to do, as I mentioned, is to um, try to build capacity within the IT, um, local IT professional. So for this, we um, organize a couple of training courses on network management and IT security. And for those training, we uh, identify, we recruit 169 participants. And uh, we have to admit that most of those participants uh, finish with, attend the, the world training, um, but only 100 uh, graduated. That means they uh, sit for, uh, and they succeeded at the last uh, final evaluation. We did also offer complementary training opportunities. Um, one particularly on how to set up um, security operation center uh, organized um, with the support of, of ISOC um, for 10 IT professionals. And also we um, uh, collaborate with the, some of the uh, organizer of the IT CyberCon um, in 2018 and 2019. Uh, some of the, the trainers at um, IT Goes Global also participate in offer presentation at, at those conferences. Through our collaboration with LACNIC, um, a lot of representatives from Haiti, more than 15, participated at the uh, LACNIC meeting in Punta Cana, uh, Panama, and Rosario in Argentina. And uh, they had the opportunity to attend complementary training as well on um, internet routing and IT security. We also organized a couple of site visits to the telecom site and the internet exchange point at Boutillier uh, with uh, IT tech for more than 30 students, instructors and, uh, and staff at, at this um, uh, technical school. We organized training also around IPv6 um, deployment. And uh, I will have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about uh, those, those training and, and other initiatives uh, like coaching and support to the internet service provider to help deploy uh, IPv6. Regarding the um, ICT cluster activities, um, we put our focus on helping strengthening the, the local internet exchange point. Um, when one of the most important things that we have identified, it, 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 is, it would be better um, for the project to uh, really focus on existing initiatives and how we can help reinforce those initiatives by working with um, a, a stakeholders um, in Haiti. And, and in, in this case, we, we work with the uh, local ICT association, ATIC, Association Haitienne pour le Développement des Technologies de l'Information et de, de la Communication, uh, who has been in charge of the internet exchange points in uh, its creation in 2009. So what we did offer as, as support is um, uh, providing new hardware, um, switches and servers, and also help with the uh, process automation we also provide some complementary training to uh, six Haitian uh, network engineers. The idea here is to make sure that we have 
um, uh, local capacity uh, to uh, manage the internet exchange point. We also help attracting new content delivery network. Um, so we have uh, an additional uh, CDN since uh, two months, um, Cloudflare, along the other one, uh, Akamai, um, Google, and uh, Facebook. Uh, and some of them uh, during the last year has decided to uh, renew their, their, their hardware. So we, we help with that as well. And also we did contribute to install the uh, local server for .ht, the Haitian uh, CCTLD. We also organized a conference on uh, internet development and, and deployment of exchange point in, in Africa. The idea here is to learn about best practices um, about a deployment of internet exchange point in a country with uh, similar uh, a socioeconomic uh, pattern as, as Haiti. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the IPv6 deployment, we organized a couple of workshops, uh, one at, at, at Banj uh, for a stakeholder from the academics, the .hccctld, the internet service providers, private and public sector, and also a conference at Banj on um, internet development and IPv6 deployment in the LATAM region. Again, the, the idea is to learn about what is happening in our region and what we can learn in terms of best practices um, uh, for, 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 for us to, to, to deploy here in, in, in the Asian context, uh, IPv6. We also support, as I mentioned earlier, the IPv6 deployment. Uh, this one was more um, a coaching, more of a coaching clinics for two internet service providers, Access Haiti and Haiti Data Network, over the course of uh, five days. We, um, as a result of, of these initiatives, we help um, uh, deploy uh, a non IPv6 prefix for both internet service provider. We help with uh, router configuration, DNS configuration, sharing of best practices regarding deployment of IPv6 from the core to the last mile. Uh, next, please. Next slide. So a few takeaways from um, those uh, various actions, those initiatives. The first one is that um, IT Goes Global is a multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, it, it offered uh, an opportunity for IDRC and, and LACNIC to work together with um, uh, all the stakeholders of the Haitian ICT ecosystem. The second one is the articulation among, among the key stakeholders in Haiti. So through all those initiatives, um, it has been made possible for the project to, to put together uh, on the same table uh, institution from the academic community, uh, the ATIC, the, the local ICT association, the um, uh, local Haitian ISOC chapter, uh, the regulatory authority, uh, IT Cybercon, and in, uh, the Haitian in, involving in ICT living in the diaspora from Canada, from the US, through IT Cybercon, through PAC, um, Haitian working at, at Microsoft. And, and also we work with uh, another important um, uh, stakeholder push on the entrepreneurship uh, training with the support of Cisco Networking Academy. Uh, we also work with uh, local CCTLD, uh, .ht and the incubator uh, bunch, Alpha, and most of all, um, the internet service providers. The third takeaway is uh, regarding LACNIC bonds with the local technical community. Through those initiatives, it has been uh, really interesting to see that the um, a local community has become closer to 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 LACNIC. Uh, as a testimony of, of that, we uh, we saw increased participation of the LACNIC meeting and other uh, activities in uh, Panama, as I mentioned, in, in Punta Cana and in, in Rosario, the last three uh, LACNIC meeting. And the fourth one is, um, you know, the in terms of best practices, we saw those initiatives 
as Ben mentioned in, the, um, in his remark, can be used to define better practices for establishment of effective model of cooperation and partnership between internet stakeholders locally uh, at the regional level and also at the global level. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Max. Thank you very much for, for that presentation. Um, we will do a first uh, pause here uh, for Q&A. Um, we've already received um, a few questions, um, but I invite all participants to uh, either raise your hand or type in your questions in the chat and we'll read them up for you. Um, so I'll start off with the, um, uh, two questions that we got from Karina uh, from your WISE uh, Sebal program. And these are questions for Maurice and Merlin. Um, Karina was wondering, uh, Maurice, if you don't mind tackling this first, uh, time dedication of students um, and uh, hours per week that they uh, spend uh, on uh, the courses. Uh, and Merlin, for you, the question is um, how you handle the selection process for the 300 women um, and how many uh, did we depart from uh, before arriving to the 300? Um, so Maurice, maybe we can start off with you. Sure. Uh, so, as I said earlier, the course is delivered over, it's a 12-week it's a program and, and four courses. So each of those courses, which as you see are quite modular, um, a module will typically take roughly one and a half to three hours to complete for students. So generally we budget uh, two, anywhere from two to three weeks for each course. Um, a couple of the courses, the digital productivity and the data course, are generally new for most students. So allocate three weeks for those and two weeks for the other courses. So over the 12 weeks, if a student commits anywhere from five to eight hours per week of self-paced study, plus their weekly two-hour meeting with facilitators, that should be more than sufficient for them to be successful in the program. Uh, Marlene, would you mind taking on the second question um, about the selection process? Yes. Good morning. Process was, was meant. Uh, Marlene, um, I think we ha you have a second computer on uh, yeah, at yes, your yes. office. There we go. Okay. The, the selection process, excuse me, was. Uh, developed and taught as being a learning process for candidates and uh, it was in made in different phases the first phase was going through um ngos to reach the populations we targeted meaning uh ngos working in difficult areas with young women and um, they would uh, help us to identify uh, potential candidates with the profiles we were looking for. And uh, based on their recommendations, so to say, they would send us the emails of the candidates and uh, a link was sent to them for, the for an online application. After the application was received, there, were, uh, there was a first selection, which led to uh, an interview. The interview was made of two different activities. One was a very simple, basic uh, technical test to see uh, what was the level of uh, acquaintance of candidates with uh, the computer world and, uh, and their digital literacy and also to interact with the people that were helping them uh, in that process. And it was followed by um, an interview that was done by uh, volunteer interviewers. In general, there were IT professionals. We managed to uh, mobilize for such activities. And um, after the interview, which was also based on a questionnaire that was completed online, we would select through a committee that included uh, COI, AZ and LACNIC, um, the candidates that were uh, invited to be participants in the process. So uh, there are different phases that help the candidates to be introduced to a new professional um, path and environment. 
Wonderful. Um, thank you, uh, Marlene, for that um, answer. Um, we do Did have I answer your question? I, I believe you have. Um, if not, I, I invite uh, Karina to um, um, react uh, on the chat. Uh, we do have uh, an additional question for um, uh, Maurice and, and Merlin. Uh, I think the two of you can tackle this. Uh, Yannick Sanetien um, um, is asking, how can you explain this 85% uh, percent, uh, graduation rate despite the factors that affected most of these students? Uh, Maurice, Merlin, I don't know if uh, either one of you wants to tackle that one. I, I can take a stab at it, although I think Marlene obviously would have a stronger on the ground perspective. Um, but, but let me say that I asked myself the same question, given the challenges of uh, the constrained resources and the security issues that arose from time to time, I'm amazed myself at how committed the students were. And I, I would put it down to, first of all, as you've just heard, there's a very robust uh, recruiting process. So I really tried to get students into the program that demonstrated um, you know, the, the, the will and the commitment to do this. Uh, secondly, the fact that they had tablets and they could consume the materials at home gave them a kind of flexibility where they could stay home and, 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 and interact with the program while offline. So I think the self-paced component was quite important. And then I can't say enough about how critical the relationship with the facilitators uh, was in so, sort of keeping students going so that if a student didn't turn up for a session, uh, a facilitator would be interacting with them to find out what's happening, are they having issues? And so I, I think a combination of all of those uh, would have led to, again, this is a very high throughput rate, I agree. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all based on the intrinsic motivation that they bring to the program. Um, if I may jump in to add a few things. In Haiti, there is somehow a very positive problem regarding education. Learners are very excited to learn, and uh, education is very valued by the population, by the young people, as well as by their parents altogether. The other thing is for this uh, exceptional rate, Maybe it's because we tried to be as uh, supportive as we could, providing to um, learners and participants whatever what the best they could have in order to be um, capable of uh, going through the learning path and getting uh, the skills as much of the skills as we wanted them to know to have meaning. They had the in-person sessions that were very important for them and that kept them motivated. That also helped them to interact with their peers, which is a very important factor. They could interact with the facilitators. The facilitators were very um, much available and uh, for, the, for the learners throughout the 12 weeks and uh, even after. And uh, also the fact that they had this blended uh, um, methodology that was uh, uh, offered to them. They could work online and also come back and get the, 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 the solutions to whatever technical problems or technological problems they had. So I think that all this, and in addition to this, let me add, our target population was young women. The young women were very keen to be introduced to the new uh, digital world and they were excited especially because it really changed their way of seeing uh, uh, internet and the technology and being involved in it and we had some real good partners like IT Fabitik that are so much committed into getting um, women into uh, the ICT world and, uh, and this is very important I think. Wonderful. Thank you so uh, much. Carolina, can I just add one thing here? Yes, of course. I think it's on. just important for context to point out that when we say it's 85% um, success, each of the students have to take an exam after each course. So over the course of the 12 weeks, they have four quizzes that they do, which are administered in an in-class uh, um, um, setting. 
So they're actually passing exams. It's not just a matter of going through the courses and finishing the courses. They are doing quizzes as well at the end of each course. So just wanted to make sure that context was clear in terms of the factors for successful completion. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Maurice, for that clarification. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, one for Max, and then we have a person that wants to uh, speak on the mic. Um, I'll start off with a question for Max, and then we'll wrap up with the, with the last one. The question is from uh, BR. Um, uh, I will read it out. Uh, thanks, Max, for your presentation. Um, apart, um, uh, let's see, collaboration from, uh, apart from the collaboration uh, from local and international partners, what are other challenges um, to mobilize Haitian students and um, professionals uh, in the ICT sector? Uh, thank, thanks, Blaise, for, for your question. Uh, as you know, for, for the um, technical training, um, our target population was more around students um, at technical schools, uh, university, and IT professionals. So the, the challenge that we have uh, seen for them is to um, cope with time management for existing activities, the, those that I've mentioned. Um, with the with with the with the training actually, um, that was one um, uh, in, in important challenge and and also um, challenges around infrastructure, electricity, in in, in internet. Um, but what we have seen is that despite those, um, the, the the training uh, was a, a a great success and part of this has to uh, be attributed to uh, the role of the facilitators to make sure that they, you know, they stay on top of what they are doing, uh, do the quizzes, and not waiting for the last minute to uh, do their, their, their exam, their, their quizzes. So it was very important, despite, despite those challenges. Thank you, Max, for that answer. Um, I will ask uh, Beatrice to open up the mic for Doyen William from Slash Roots. Um, for an additional question, and then we'll move on to the remaining two presentations. Sure, um, thank you guys. I wanted, well, it's a bit of a two-part question and I tried to type it very quickly before, but um, <laughs> that's unfortunately didn't work. The, I noted that we have a 14% attrition rate, um, and so we have that 85, 86% success rate. And I wanted to know the difference between that success rate and what I saw in, I believe it was Max's presentation of a, of a graduate of a hundred people graduating, which works out to about 69% of the people who completed the actual course graduating. So I wanted some clarification on that. Um, and that's part one of my question. And part two is based on the insights around the successful completion of the course. Um, if there is that slight disparity, um, if we have any insight with regards to how we can actually increase the graduation rate to meet the success rate. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that uh, question um, and uh, for comparing really the, the results of the two trainings. Uh, if I may, uh, I'll have a first uh, stab at, at, at answering this question. Um, I think the difference in graduation rates between uh, the IT professionals uh, online course and, and, um, and the one that was uh, targeted uh, for uh, our women beneficiaries is, um, uh, I guess the answer lies in sort of the profile um, of, of the people that took the courses. The IT pros uh, were largely uh, employed um, and had um, a, a range of uh, domestic and work responsibilities that limited their ability uh, to dedicate more fully to the, uh, to the courses. Um, and I think that impacted uh, negatively in the total graduation rate and also attrition rate for that specific course. Uh, the fact that we were dealing with um, uh, uh, with a slightly uh, sort of different uh, profile um, uh, or, or type of students. Um, so I would say that's um, uh, one of the things that we saw uh, in terms of um, your first question. Um, here, I'd like to maybe invite um, either Marlene uh, Priyanka as well, who did the uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, and compared the, uh, the two uh, sort of uh, target groups, um, or even Max uh, to jump in as well. I don't know if you guys have any uh, additional thoughts or comments uh, to address this question. 
So, um, can I speak? This yeah, is Priyanka please, from 3 by 3 Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's a really good question. Um, we conducted the m &E study over the end of two years, um, new surveys, interviews, and focus groups um, to exactly find out <laughs> what's happening uh, with the graduation rates and the attrition rates. And the, as Carolina suggest, uh, uh, stated, that the major difference between the two groups was that um, the uh, young women group uh, were excited. They were dealing with um, uh, facilita in-person facilitation more than um, the IT pro group initially in the first cohort. And um, the orientation day um, that they had and the in-person facilitation that they had and the pace pacing of the program did lend into a higher graduation rate. With the IT professionals, um, the in-person facilitation um, wasn't a strong component initially. Um, they also had constraints uh, regarding internet access because they would often travel um, uh, on trips related to work where they would lose access to internet or where they wouldn't be able to meet the schedule of activities. And what we realized that uh, an important learning uh, from that uh, was to be able to provide them with flexibility. So later on in the program, we did um, came up with the recommendation of letting the exam date and self-pacing be more flexible so that the graduation rate can increase because it's mostly to do with time commitment and less to do with motivation or the ability to complete the program. Wonderful. Thank you, Priyanka. I think that provides uh, quite a bit of context uh, to, to the questions. Um, I propose, um, I, I understand we have uh, one more person uh, interested in speaking, um, but for sake of time, we will move ahead with the next two uh, presentations and leave additional questions for the last uh, Q&A segment. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Marlene Sam now um, to uh, take the floor for the next presentation on um, online employment. Yes, thank you, Carolina. Thank you to all of you. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm very happy and pleased to have this opportunity to thank everyone because, you know, uh, we've been here as a field of practitioners. Each of the beneficiaries were faces for us. As you know, very often, uh, Haiti is a lab for you know the rest of the world as we uh, experience um, very vanguard initiatives and this is one because this initiative is mainly about you know how to uh, address the barriers to digital economy to mitigate high youth unemployment in uh, a very uh, weak economy such as Haiti. Um, the beneficiaries. Uh, went through the, first of all, the, um, the training, that is the blended training, and they were um, trained not only to, to acquire new skills, but also soft skills development, which are so important when you uh, have to work in, um, in a digital environment, and this is what we were preparing them for. So we are partners. Uh, we have SOM, and um, we haven't yet uh, harvested what we have sown because, unfortunately, the employment component uh, was deployed uh, fully um, at a time when the country was experiencing a lot of um, of uh, unrest, political, social, and economic unrest, and the challenges were even more than uh, they were before because of uh, the electricity shortages and other um, new uh, problems in terms of security for uh, our women uh, beneficiaries for them to move in the metropolitan area. But say, this being said, uh, we can, um, next slide please, we can talk about something that is very 
important. As I said before, we are in a positive way of um, getting people on board jobs. And there are, Carolina, the next slide, please. There are some advantages in uh, Haiti. The labor force, we were, think we were addressing and taking care of and coaching uh, young women. And uh, it is a very large labor pool. And uh, we also uh, have the reputation Haitians have abroad, which is that of uh, hardworking, entrepreneurial, and resilient. So apart from that, we also have this other uh, advantage, that of the language, which is in addition to the uh, or, um, uh, Haitian Creole, French, English, and with neighboring DR, Spanish. So uh, we build on this multilingual uh, environment and we try to do as much as uh, possible to empower more of the girls and, and prepare them for this, uh, to take advantage of the need or other um, possible opportunities in the industry. First, and then uh, the opportunities we investigated are the ones, you know, uh, linked to the proximity of uh, the American and uh, the North American markets, uh, the United States and Canada. And also uh, we relied a lot on the uh, diaspora living in search areas. So those are the advantages we uh, investigated. And the other thing, uh, factor that we considered in the employment component is the one linked to Haiti being the, um, not only the poorest country of the hemisphere, but also um, the young girls living in uh, disadvantaged areas are the beneficiaries of this project. And it is the, 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 the fact that, you know, employers could, uh, help and uh, support uh, and, uh, and kind of uh, uh, access, uh, uh, introduce the, this target population to employment is a uh, marketing handle that is also um, important for our um, employment component. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, we tried to introduce our beneficiaries to uh, the platforms that were based on, you know, some talents that we uh, kind of derived from the, um, the, 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 the factors that I mentioned before. And the fact is that we helped the graduates to get prepared to uh, work with uh, local BPOs or even uh, uh, regional BPOs uh, and also to work with uh, local initiatives uh, through by identifying their own uh, uh, talents and doing so by get creating profiles on the online platforms that we um, identify a, a few uh, one of them being freelancer and to help them and coach them with the assistance of uh, two interns to prepare online gigs and get ready to work independently. Next slide. We focus on the importance of getting the girls and the graduates from the project to online platforms because it was important for us to see, you know, uh, what were the what was the angle, the best angle of attack for them to, 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 to reach those markets? Um, this was a little bit short, in, let's say, because of uh, the um, deterioration of the situation. But somehow we did manage to uh, train uh, almost 100 of our beneficiaries in uh, getting profiles on the platforms and preparing for gigs and being coached by the interns. Uh, the idea was also to um, help them 
and by um, with a mentor um, uh, mentorship uh, um, initiatives to prepare them to transition to a good um, professional life, not only by securing internships for some of them, which we did, uh, and also by getting them ready for interviews. And uh, we did uh, succeed in accompanying some of the girls, some of our beneficiaries graduates into uh, all along. Uh, the results are limited, but the fact is the engagement of an employment, unemployed uh, students was very high. And uh, we secured some uh, very uh, positively reviewed gigs on uh, freelancer platform. And uh, we secured nine mentorships and two jobs on, in the domestic market for our beneficiaries. The mentorship program involved um, basically the graduates of the first and second cohort. The third cohort, unfortunately, um, which ended in uh, July, um, could not benefit from this direct mentorship program, even though they still remain connected with all the, with all the um, schemes that uh, IT put in place. And the girls are very active in communicating between themselves. Um, then uh, the gender workshops we organize for them, which is another very important aspect, uh, uh, a component activity for us. Uh, we had uh, gender workshops for all our graduates. And uh, the objective was to prepare them for a professional life uh, as women as young women and uh, how to better empower them in the professional, including, which is very important, digital environment. And um, so we, to finish the limitations to the um, results of this component, if I may say, are a little bit frustrating because of the deterioration of the situation, but at the same time, they are very encouraging because the last cohort, the girls were very committed in spite of the very difficult uh, periods they had to go through and in, in spite of the delays in starting the selection process and uh, was very, um, was very um, long because of uh, unrest in the city, because our area for intervention was uh, uh, Port-au-Prince, the metropolitan area of Port-au-Prince, including the, the five communes of, the, of this area. But um, what is important is that we have the impression that thanks to the mentorship program, thanks to the exit strategy we are considering of getting, if possible, uh, some of the girls to be um, uh, themselves uh, independently uh, and, uh, and coached by uh, some of our partners in the next days to get more involved into uh, the um, digital uh, employment uh, world. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Marlene, for that presentation. Uh, presentation. I'd like to um, invite uh, Priyanka to continue on uh, with the uh, last and final presentations, uh, presentation on lessons uh, on online work and gender transformation. Uh, Priyanka, please uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, hi, this is Priyanka from 3 by 3 Design. Um, social innovation consultancy um, conducted the m and &E study over the span of two years. Um, some of the findings which have already been discussed uh, front in the presentation. And what I would be talking through is uh, the original hypothesis of the program and some of the lessons that we learned specifically around the employment component um, through the surveys and the focus groups and interviews that we conducted with the participants of the program. Next. 
Um, so the program was designed with the assumption that um, meeting some of the infrastructural needs and upgradation of digital skills would equip the unemployed youth of Haiti to meet the surplus jobs that are available on the online platform. Um, the goal was to increase women access to employment and um, the thought was that the two complements, one building digital capacities to the internet and data practitioner course and the provision of like an office space uh, could uh, overcome these infrastructural constraints and skill constraints that women often face when they apply for jobs on online platform. Next. But as even during a study, what we found that um, um, there are a lot of barriers that are uh, that need to be mitigated, that need to be addressed before that can become a reality. That infrastructure and skill upgradation is not enough. Um, in February 2019, we saw anti-corruption protests intensify, causing fuel shortages and civil rights in the streets the pop-up demonstrations and um, other uh, things that happen on the street made travel expensive and unsafe. The fuel shortage made the use of power backups extremely difficult. Um, it also brought to a standstill or slowed the pace of some of the legal frameworks that were being updated around the digital economy, um, ranging from labor laws uh, that would work better for the ICT are right now simply informed by entertainment and hospitality industry to how service providers can work in the domestic market while they're catering to an international market. Um, next. And so as we conducted the surveys, um, we found that the infrastructural constraints that we thought initially was going to be a big factor actually went down. Um, and this is despite all the political protest and the fuel shortages that were happening. And some of the other factors that we not thought would be an intrinsic uh, problem actually came up first. Or that those that we thought could, could have been addressed by the skill upgradation. So um, at the top where job experience or referrals that are required for market immersion and access to a credit card for the payment mechanism to necessary language skills. Next. Um, and so many graduates had anticipated that they would not have such high barrier to entry to the online platforms. Um, first of all, more than 90% of the graduates did not have proficiency in English. Um, as one of the employment program coordinator, Alda noted, the women had trouble logging in on a website that didn't have interface in French. So uh, the proficiency was basic or like no proficiency at all. And this became a constraint because platforms that offer interface in French are limited and in out there in a competitive already competitive world, it limited them to platforms that provide that interface and opportunities that um, are there in English were out of the game. The credibility was also a huge factor as we saw in the survey response, 53.51% uh, of the graduates said, and it is like the top challenge, said that that was the most limiting factor um, when a corporate account was created to mitigate the lack of experience, many graduates still felt that they lacked the certification and experience required to bid in the highly competitive market of the online platform. And that other bidders that had history of performance and experience or who could show the previous projects that they have worked on um, would usually win the bids and they would be left behind. And so it's a chicken and egg situation. They need the first experience in order to get more bit, bit, uh, Yes, but the, it, it became such a huge barrier that they were never able to get that first gig or like first online job. Um, another finding that was revealed during focus groups was that graduate anticipated that after applying, 
to few bids, they would get the jobs. But they realized early in the process that it takes much more upfront time than they anticipated, that they have to apply to a high number of bids to get when even one. And for those that were pursuing this to support their studies or needed income quickly got demotivated from applying to more bids. As Karina said, that the whole pro persona, uh, the personas that emerge from the study indicate that uh, they're pursuing multiple opportunities and that uh, this is something that they want to do in the interim, maybe transition it to full time later on, but it is supplementing what they're already doing right now. Um, financial inclusion also more than like more than half, like 54.39 percent of the survey respondents uh, reported access to a credit card as the top challenge. Most of the graduates did not have jobs or salaries and income high enough to get a credit card from the banks in Haiti. They also reported that uh, platforms such as Freelancer did not accept credit cards from BRH, which is a Haiti national bank. So the inability to establish payment pathways indicated that either that workshops, that investment need to be made on workshops that can train the graduates on alternative strategies for payment or to improve financial literacy because their inability to see that they can get paid was a big demotivating factor. I'll um, speak uh, to one student who's like, while I was creating the profile, I dressed up really nicely, put on a blazer and everything, but to see that I uh, couldn't even um, speak English language or haven't been certified or do not have a credit card discouraged me. Access or apply uh, to online jobs. Next. Cultural preferences and competing interests were some other barriers that also prevented graduates from engaging with the platform. Um, the, um, I think there's a slide, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, the first was the employment preferences. Um, lack of strategy and inability to see a solution to bid successfully demotivate many graduates from coming to the office that was set up by LACNIC. Um, it also led them to spend more time applying, applying to jobs available in domestic markets where they might have a chance to convince the employer in person. Um, as one of the IDP graduates reported that um, it's like you apply and apply all the time and no one ever responds. So um, it's better if I put this time towards domestic markets where I can at least drop by and say hello or hi or like get an interview in the process. Um, educational ambition, also many graduates um, were already, as you could see um, in the slide that was uh, shared by Carolina, um, majority of the graduates were pursuing either part-time employment or part-time education, full-time education at the university. Um, and we saw that through uh, study and research as well that uh, those who were engaged with the employment component of the program that came late after the course were either unemployed or were only partially engaged in other things. The people, the graduates who uh, were full-time engaged in studies uh, showed less engagement. So they had pathways uh, that went either to more traditional paths of becoming an engineer or medical and this course was just to upgrade the digital skills or they they wanted the uh, security of having another uh, graduate degree while they also uh, experiment with how independent work might work out so everyone was um, focused on multiple pathway, multiple career pathways um, to have that security in an extremely fragile environment and um, seeing that the bits were not uh, giving any results, they again, um, that, that became a barrier as well. Um, this led to market preferences where they started, pref uh, uh, started looking at domestic markets more. Um, 
uh, some graduates also reported that there was a cultural norm of distrusting strangers in Haiti and the fear of fraud and scabs also prevented them from engaging in online work that is paid post delivery. Next. Um, some of the gender uh, barriers that um, the graduates reported uh, range from verbal harassment on streets if they're out there in, uh, in the streets which offer hotspots just to access internet um, were often perceived as if they were chatting with men and um, that perception would let to uh, some of the people on these streets harassing them. Um, two access barriers were the insecure environment, because of the insecure environment, the uh, other members in the household prohibited them from going out of the house during the evenings or night, and that limited the number of hours that they could work. Um, they, women generally also indicated that they lacked awareness about opportunities in digital domains and that uh, they wanted to understand more what e-specialization means or what each engagement opportunity means beyond the work that they already learned through the online course. Next. Um, but despite all these barriers um, and challenges that were reported by the graduates, uh, more than 80% of the graduates still came back saying that uh, we do want to understand online platforms and online work. It is still lucrative for us. And the perceived benefits included um, from increased opportunities. They felt that all the jobs are now shifting online, um, that uh, this is what is next, and that they should know how to transcend geographical boundaries and how to um, access these posts that are offered online. They also valued the ability to balance paid work with other things such as part-time university education or operating their own business or household responsibility. And this goes back to the point that I've been stating again and again that uh, in a fragile environment, they are looking at multiple pathways. So this flexible arrangement do provide them the ability to balance it with other things that they're pursuing. Um, um, again, the um, comfort of working from a space, be it home or a university or a wor uh, workplace, independently um, and not having to go to an office setup um, daily in an environment which makes it makes travel unsafe was also valued a lot. The graduates explained that they do see that as a benefit of working online. And uh, all of this led them to believe that it would save them in, in the long term time and money because transportation is expensive, it's unreliable, and um, it, the management of time is in, is in their hands rather than someone else. Next. Some of the transformative changes uh, were also reported um, where the women felt that the perceptions of the people around them, um, including the family members and the friends have changed. Um, they were asked for more technical support. Um, their access to digital devices such as laptops, routers, modems increased. Um, the gender role graduate experience greater acceptance of their work roles and less expectations for the graduates to do household work at home. Next. They also experienced a change in themselves. Um, Maurice uh, talked about this um, initially about how they it, it wasn't just learning about the data skills or the social networks, but also how they felt more confident in how they are communicating over internet or navigated the on, navigating the online world. So from how they communicate and how they make their access more secure to how uh, comfortable they felt ac accessing online resources to increase their knowledge uh, was a big benefit that they experienced. 
they also uh, mentioned that they mentored young siblings, friends, and youth in similar programs, sharing knowledge and taking leadership roles, um, which also led to an increase in self-confidence. Um, the graduates felt that the program helped them in inculcate time management and discipline in their lives um, through the productivity tools and some of the time management sessions that they learned, which also helped them um, prioritize their time if the online work system becomes um, successful. Um, and they appreciated the gender workshops um, that were part of the employment component of the program uh, for instilling awareness of gender rights, but also understanding what is their value in the workplace and having greater knowledge about it. Next. Which, uh, despite the, so these transformative chains and the uh, just a desire to pursue online work, despite all the constraints that the graduates faced, um, did, uh, does make investment in strategies to overcome all the high entry barriers to market immersion that graduates uh, uh, experience uh, seem valid. And um, some of the recommendations that we uh, do have involved one establishing prior relationship with employers and um, bidding agencies so that uh, that first job, that first gig, which plays such an important role in the certification and the credibility of people and like their first entry into the market becomes easier than what it is right now. Um, it also helped to reestablish relationships in domestic markets, which were um, unfortunately severely impacted by the political rights because that negatively impacted the economy, but um, in a more political stable environment, um, it becomes valuable to gain those, secure those in internships because graduates can mention that they've done work in a similar um, atmosphere. On, on similar assignment. Um, there is also a need to invest in soft skills and language skills development. So just learning digital skills would not help. And these soft skills range from development of CV, which was already uh, provided as part of the program, but also negotiation with clients and language exposure so they can at least have the ability to uh, look at opportunities in English. They, they still might be focused on French and Haitian Creole, but at least be able to navigate these platforms. Um, the gender transformative changes indicate that gender awareness workshops are also very critical and coupled with mentorship activities could lead to greater confidence. Next. Um, and I, I would conclude with the same thought that I began that pursuit of multiple pathways is reflective of insecure political and economic environments of Haiti and a development program, so workforce development program or like student development program need to focus on these multiple pathways instead of just focusing line work, ensuring market immersion and upward mobility than um, simply focusing on one aspect of the program. Next. And that there are two fronts to it. Um, building capacities of women through online courses that overcome not just the digital skill constraints, infrastructure constraints, but also gender, culture, and social barriers through targeted workshops, investment in language exposure, and soft skills development, but also supporting market version and upward mobility through mentorship activities, one-on-one -on -one guidance, and securing contracts both in international and domestic markets to overcome these high barriers experience because of the work trade environment and the reverse auction bidding systems of online platform. Next. So with that, I would end and open it for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Priyanka, for that presentation. Um, do we have any questions uh, in the chat? Um, Beatrice, if you don't mind. We don't have any questions right now. Okay. All right. Um, I will um, just say a few uh, wrap up remarks um, uh, while we wait to see if anyone has any questions before we depart. 
Um, we will be, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have recorded the webinar and we'll be sharing the recording um, with all the participants as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the entire team remains uh, available to all of you to um, answer additional questions that may come up after today's um, uh, webinar. Um, and, um, uh, you know, do get in touch um, if, uh, you know, you want to even bounce off ideas for your own projects uh, and so forth. We're happy uh, to be a resource for all um, uh, those of you who have participated of the webinar today. Um, Beatrice, do we have any questions? Uh, if not, I will ask the partners um, if they have any uh, parting thoughts. Um, uh, I, I, we have Jean-Marie. Uh, are you there? To, I think he had a question or, or a comment during the last uh, Q&A um, space that we did. All right. Um, so I believe it was uh, Jean-Marie Altema. Um, if you do have any questions or comments that you'd like to make, please use the um, uh, hand up uh, button. Well, we figured that out. Um, I don't know if the, uh, any of the uh, panelists have any parting thoughts. Otherwise, we'll just uh, give it a minute to see if we get one more uh, comment. And if not, we'll just go ahead and wrap up. Hello. Hi there, we hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry to be late, and I thank you for the, for the presentation. And I, I, it was clear, but uh, the point that I would like to make, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a question. Then, Did you ask the participant uh, about what they would like to, to do in the future? Like, uh, if, like it's... Uh, they are interested in creating like their own companies and how many of them then are interested in that and also how many of them then are interested to work somewhere it is did you ask this question um i will uh, okay. direct that question to you uh priyanka sure um yes we um in the uh both in the interim survey and the surveys that we uh conducted with the graduates two months post the completion of the program uh we asked one about the employment preferences or even work status preferences so we were not even focused on works uh, like employment only we were like do you want to pursue full-time after this education or a part-time education do you want to start your own business or do you want to do freelance or independent work part-time work or full-time employment work and we always left like an optional uh, category open where they can discuss about their passion projects and other things and the results still indicated that they do want to even if there were students who were pursuing part-time and uh, full-time university education, uh, majority of the women at least still wanted to pursue independent work or part-time employment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I add okay. something? Can I jump in? I have a comment to add to this question, which is uh, from Jean-Marie, uh, who was one of our volunteer uh, interviewers, I must say. Um, we did ask um, our beneficiaries, discussing with them, and even uh, made a, a survey. Um, and um, there is one thing. They needed to have more exposure to um, financial inclusion issues, and this was done. We had seven of uh, our beneficiaries that participated in a workshop on uh, financial inclusion that was organized by a partner projects. And there was also the opportunity that was offered to them to quite a number. In fact, they were uh, IT pros and uh, the girls. Uh, beneficiaries uh, from the three cohorts, they had the opportunity to to attend or to participate uh, in a Cisco training on entrepreneurship, and uh, uh, more than uh, 40 of them did that very very actively until the end. To finish on this, 
the, in the exit strategy we are considering now, uh, a group of girls is determined to continue and develop their, expand their activities on bidding online and coaching the rest of the beneficiaries. And we are considering very seriously on how to help them, assist them to, um, to, to get started on, on, the, on, the, on the platforms in the digital uh, industry. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Marlene, for adding uh, that comment. I think that uh, we had uh, Maurice, is that right? Who wanted to add an additional comment to this question? Yeah, I was just going to make the, the observation that outside of the formal m and &E and the sort of structured focus groups, um, within the courses themselves, at the end of every module, we have a set of open-ended reflection questions that we invite the students to come comment on, um, on on different aspects of you know not just the content they covered but aspects relating to themselves personally or their context uh, within Haiti and I say that to say that it's just very it was very interesting and insightful just reading their comments throughout the program because at the end of each module they're giving this very candid open-ended perspective on how they see things and that was actually valuable in, insight for the program in terms of understanding their own thinking and how that thinking evolved throughout the program. I just wanted to, to offer that as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Shemaria Tema, do you have a, um, a reaction or comment to that? I think we interrupted you earlier. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I got it. Thank you, Marlene, for your answers and thank you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, Beatrice, do we have any other questions? Yes, we have a question from Janik. Janik, I don't know if you would like to, to say that uh, live, out loud, or would you, would you rather me reading it? She was asking uh, regarding the, the language barrier. Uh, and I read, she says, while Marlene mentioned the language as a comparative advantage, Priyanka said it is a barrier because of lack of proficiency in English. I feel like there is a bit of contradiction between the both. I can address that. Um, so in our demand research, we uh, first of all did see um, the fact that a lot of Haitians can speak three languages sometimes, uh, from Haitian Creole French um, and between Spanish and English, um, was a, com a comparative advantage in the online world. Um, Second, the fact that there are very few people who can conduct assignments in Haitian Creole is also an advantage. Uh, for example, one of our employers um, had posted work for transcription um, and he couldn't find anyone who could transcribe um, something or translate something which was in Haitian Creole. Like These are the interviews they conducted and um, he got very few bits for them. So it, it does have an advantage, but at the same time, um, the lack of proficiency in English with some, like with some of the graduates not even being able to log in with others having difficulty and like less familiarity with it and having more comfort level in French and Haitian Creole uh, work as a disadvantage. Um, which is why uh, just even having language exposure through the program um, uh, would have the capability is there. The course could be switched between English and French, but uh, in, enforcing that more, uh, ensuring that they do navigate that uh, and as well, like having the assignments, having some interfaces or some time where they can can be exposed to that language would be helpful. Wonderful. Thank you for that clarification and, um, and for the question as well. It's a very relevant point. Um, I think we uh, don't have any additional questions. Um, uh, Bea, do correct me if I'm mistaken. No, we don't we have, have anything any. else coming in. Wonderful. Um, so we are good to wrap up. Uh, once again, we wanted to thank uh, everyone for participating today. Um, and do keep in touch. Uh, we are happy to answer additional questions. Thank you uh, very much to all the panelists uh, as well for participating today. Um, have a good day and uh, we'll stop the recording uh, here. Thank you.